You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Cynthia Tulin Wilson on my show, Author to Author. And today I am here with Marge John Julio, who has written a book named Non Nobis Domine. How are you today? I'm just doing fine. Thank you, Cynthia. That's great. Oh, so um, that's uh, what is that in English? Non Nobis Domine. Well, actually, it's it's not unto us, O Lord, meaning not me, but you, Lord. Okay. Okay. That's nice. Um, okay. So what is it that led you to uh, write this? Well, <laughs> it's really a funny story. I um, spent a lot of time in adoration. And when you spend time in silence in front of the Lord in adoration, you get a lot of projects from him. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was happening so frequently that I felt like I needed a spiritual director to figure out, was this coming from me or was that coming from God that it, I should be doing these projects? So I found a spiritual director who was a Cistercian monk. Somebody told me, you need to get a good, strong, tough guy. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was one of those that escaped from Hungary and he's here mm-hmm. in Dallas. And so he became my spiritual director and I would go to him just to discern if these projects were from, coming from God. Over the, all the years, i was a daily adorer from 11 to midnight for 23 years. And Mm -hmm. I would come to him and the fruits of the, the projects that I was given adoration were astronomical. And so he was the one that said I needed to write a book about it. Now Mm -hmm. I was very resistant. I really didn't want to write a book because there's actually um, a lot of personal things within it Mm -hmm. that I had to, you know, let people know my own shortcomings. And he said, just get over it and do it. And the reason Mm -hmm. that he wanted me, he insisted that I write the book was because he said, in today's world, we're so uh, self-oriented, we're so computer-oriented, we're always looking at our phones. We've eliminated God and we have not re- we don't recognize any longer that God really is, exists and he is intimately involved in everything in our lives. And the stories, there's 40 stories. They're all 40 short stories in the book. They all depict how intimately he is involved in our lives. And they're very diverse stories. They're, they're, they, go, they range from all different uh, situations, such as suicide, drug addiction, atheism, abortion, all that kind of stuff. But they all, at the end of the story, show God's love and mercy. So, uh, you know, over the years, many people, friends knew some of these stories, and they were always insisting that I write a book about it. But I always just ignored them. But when it came Mm -hmm. to Father Julius and him telling me to do it, I had to obey. And so I'm really not an author. I just... I'm an obedient servant of what was expected of me. So, and that's how the book came to be. Mm -hmm. And it's really amazing because I didn't have a publisher or anything like that. In fact, I sent it to one place and, you know, since I'm not an author, I'm not a writer, you know, they came back to me and said, it really needs to be edited because, you know, Mm -hmm. I was just writing all these stories down not thinking of punctuation anything yeah yeah and you know if you're if you're not really an author you're just a a little person like me you know you're not even thinking in those terms so then I had friends I had four people edit the book four different people and um each of them were extremely affected every time they would edit it and so they kept saying you need to get this out there Mm -hmm. but I didn't have a publisher so I was very close friends with some nuns at Mother Angelica's and they knew about it and they said look you've done so many projects yourself why why don't you just do it why don't you just go get it printed so that's what I did I went to a printer and got it printed and the father said everybody has to buy the book so they have a connection with it and they they then will read it you know so Mm -hmm. we charged just what the printer charged me it was fifteen dollars and within just months, by word of mouth, with no publicity, 900 books were sold. Wow. 
I mean, so that was, you know, it was kind of shocking that well, what would happen is that people would buy a book because they knew me, you know, and they were just doing it, I guess, as a favor. But then they'd read it. Then they'd call me and say, I want 10 more because I'm giving them as Christmas presents or I'm giving mm-hmm. them, you know, they people would keep them in the house and then 10, 20, 30, buy, you know, that's how they'd buy it in volume. So mm-hmm. now, um, so now with, um, on route publishing heard about it through a, you know, a friend in Washington, DC who contacted him and said, this book has to be published. And so after he read it, he said, I'm publishing it. So I think today yeah. is the day mm-hmm. it's being published in mm-hmm. the day that we're talking. I think he's right now in the process of getting it out there in, in the mm-hmm. open world now. So. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So these are all like um, mini memoir stories. Is that what you're? Well, you know, it's really interesting. People always say, you know, they're actually they're um, like, for instance, the first story that I did, which was the most difficult for me, uh, was a story about my brother and my brother was a heroin addict. And it's um, I get really. it's, it's, it's very difficult to tell the story. You know, he died of an overdose and Mm -hmm. it was a young man, very bright young man, all that kind of stuff. And so I did that one as the first one because it was the hardest one and I Mm -hmm. wanted to get it behind me. Um, Mm -hmm. But then there were other stories. There are several that, you know, are personal stories, but then there are a lot of them are stories of people that I know that, God affected with his love and mercy. And he allowed me to participate with them in, mm-hmm. in the actions that he was taking in their lives. Um, there's a story. Um, I was a sidewalk counselor in the pro-life movement here in Dallas. I was on the board of Catholic pro-life committee and I would go out and be at the um, abortion clinics. And there are several stories of, people changing their minds, you know, mm-hmm. I'm doing it, but it's, it's almost miraculous how, um, how it comes about uh, because I'll give you an example. One of the, one of the stories um, I went to the abortion clinic in the morning and there was nobody there and I was really exhausted. I really didn't want to be there, but I prayed to the Lord and said, you know, let me just be here for, for your purposes. And then, all of a sudden I heard prayer worries behind me. I was always the one that had to speak to the person that I I was the spokesperson and everybody else with the prayer worries. And all of a sudden this beautiful young girl at 17, 18 comes up with two men, two young men looked really evil and they were, you could tell forcing her. She was about nine months pregnant. So it was going to be a really bad, bad situation. Um, and she was looking at me with very sad eyes, but they were forcing her to go in. Well, I said to the Lord, give me the words that I need to say to this person in order to help them. And I said to him, you, God gave us all a purpose in life. And your purpose is to be a hero today. You have to be heroic and be a hero and stop this travesty uh, because it was a partial birth abortion, obviously. Yeah. And, but he was, sort of like a gang kind of type and would just curse me and scream at me to leave him alone. Anyway, we gave up, he brought her in and then we all left to go home and we were devastated, totally, totally devastated that we couldn't reach this person. But then the the weirdest thing happened. So the next day I get a phone call from the um, pro-life center and they knew that I stood outside the abortion clinic. They said, we, we have to ask you a question. What went on yesterday at the clinic? I said, what are you talking about? How do you even know I was there? They said, we came, we were in the office. All of a sudden, two young men and a young girl come barging in, screaming. They pulled her off the table in the abortion clinic, brought her to the pro-life center, 
screaming and saying, we need a doctor, we need a doctor, we need to stop this. They didn't, I mean, the, the, the whole center was berserk. They didn't know what to do. One of the volunteers had a brother that was a doctor. They called him and they said, he said, I've never done anything like this. Bring her here to me right away. I'll try and help you. Anyway, the baby's life was saved. But oh. the, the point was that the young man, the gang member type that was forcing her, kept screaming to them, tell that lady that I was a hero today. So it was the words that God gave me that he knew would affect this young man to do what he did and pull the girl off the table. So that's like an example of the kind of stories. It was not that it's a personal story about me. It was a personal story about God's love and mercy and how Mm -hmm. he was able to get through to these evil centered young men and then to change them totally. And so Mm -hmm. now that, child is probably about 16, 17 years old right now. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, several stories, you know, that are similar to that within the book. So, and as a result, you know, um, many of the people that I I don't even know that bought the book, but I would get emails because they had my email and they would say that there was one specific story that affected them because it, it was sort of the same kind of thing that happened in their life. So, God knew what he was doing. You know, the, it, mm-hmm. that's why I call it non nobis domine. It's not about me. You know, mm-hmm. it, in fact, sometimes when I, the first printing of the books, you know, came out, people would say, will you sign the book for me? And I would say, no, I can't sign the book because I didn't write the book. It, it, the book is the Lord. You have to get him to sign it. Now he's mm-hmm. probably not going to sign it physically, Mm-hmm. But if he signs it on your heart and your soul, that's exactly what it is that's meant to happen in the book. So I refuse to sign it because mm-hmm. the stories are all God's stories. And they're, mm-hmm. Father, Father Julius would say, people think that these things are coincidences, you know, but it's not a coincidence. Mm-hmm. It's a God incident, right? I mean, I'm sure... Yeah. The, the thing I'm sure you've had those things happen in your life too, but we've lost the sense of them and we don't recognize them anymore. And that's why Father wanted to raise the awareness level of people so that they would once again see that God is there and, mm-hmm. and is working towards with love and mercy towards them. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah. <clears throat> I've not had um, that kind of experience, but I had. Um, let's see. So it was, um, uh, it had to have been 1961. How bad is that? <laughs> I can remember this. 1961. Um, my mother told me that she had, uh, tried to chemically abort me in 1949. Oh, my God. And that explains, you know, uh, I had to have facial reconstruction, surgical facial reconstruction twice. And I had um, all the joints on the left side of my body are a little smaller than the ones on the right. So if I run or something, it, you know, it's like it's actually kind of funny. <laughs> but anyway, um, but, yeah, I was 11 when she told me and um, that had a, uh, if she hadn't told me, I probably would not have um, have had as rough a life. But I mean, I really felt to a great extent that I was a throwaway. Um, but well, I did get over that. <laughs> no, well, but, that is amazing, though, that she told you. What, what, what do you think led her to then confess it to you at 11 years old? Uh, the only thing I can think of is that my, I don't think, I think my mother was not, um, intelligent. Uh Um, and I think, you know, at that time, my father, who was a serial adulterer during the whole marriage, Mm -hmm. excuse me. Um, I think that probably what happened was she was thinking if she shared that with me, that we'd be closer, that would be friends, Uh or it could be that she just wanted to really get rid of me just by terminating any psychological, uh, tie. I don't know. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I, um, I took them in when they were old and uh, me and my, my first husband who died of cancer. And, um, I'll tell you, it it was, it was awful. 
you know, she was always angry. Um, I don't, you know, I have no idea. Of, I have thoughts about what was wrong with her, but I don't know that. I think that she had been a model and he had been a model at the Rhode Island School of Design. And so they were both beautiful people, but she wasn't beautiful enough for him, even though he married her. And I think that's what might have led to it. I did look. I tried to see if there were any other babies, um, you know, that maybe my fa- I didn't look for her for her to have had other babies. I knew she didn't. But I, I looked to see if he had had others. And I couldn't, you know, doing that, ge- uh, the genetic thing through ancestry and whatnot. But he was he was a wild man. So I think, you know, there's probably other relatives out there that I don't know about. But I'm 73 now. So many of if they were. They probably did by now. So, did that um, affect you in a way that you see? I, I think about this. I mean, did you get involved in the pro life uh, in at all? No, I think at that point there wasn't much because um, I was eleven, would have been sixty-one, and I was not politically aware at all. You know, um, I um, eventually with Sebastian's uh, publishing house, I published the story of what my life had been like because of being told that. I mean, yeah. I really went off the rails, so to speak. And yeah. um, so I, you know, I wrote that story because, you know, eventually I converted to Catholicism because of a religious experience. Right. And the to me, one of the, the things I'm proudest about in my life is that I trained, uh, academically trained, for the academic uh, formation, over 200 priests. And so I don't know, probably 60 sisters, a whole bunch of men who were already priests who were going for a master's and a lot of lay people, hundreds of them. And so I think, okay, you know, that's what I'm proud of. And it amazes me. I mean, not proud, like bragging, but proud. And it's like, I think to myself, Really, if my mother had had her way and hadn't, she told me the only reason she stopped the abortion, she was, she started to bleed. So she was afraid she would die So to save her life. And so so that, that terminated our relationship. I had to live with them. I, you know, until I was old enough to leave and I did take them in when I was old, when they were older, but there was no love um, because I knew that. You know, when she told me, once she said the words, I stopped. I When I said to her, why did you stop? I thought she was going to say, because I didn't want to lose you. Instead, she said, I was afraid I would die. I was going to die. And I never felt, I never cared about her again. I did what I was supposed to do, which I've always tried to do the right thing. But I never cared for her. But, you know, it's very interesting because you've then... Uh, taught all those priests and lay people. Yeah. And all this. So, so there is fruits that, as a result of it, it's always mm-hmm. good. It comes out of evil. And I think about like, I got involved in the pro-life movement for all those years, because when I was, I, I worked for the airlines and there was a girl there that was got pregnant and she was my girlfriend. And she, I drove her to the abortion clinic uh-huh. to get an abortion. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, you say, I was not political. I was away from the church then. I was not aware of what I was doing. But then when the awareness came, when the Lord opened my mind, then I realized I was an accomplice to murder. Yeah. I mean, that, so then as a result of that, I became so zealous about yeah. the pro-life movement. And I would, I stand, would stand outside those abortion clinics every week for 14 years, you know, mm-hmm. because I was trying in some way to compensate for what I had done. And so there was fruit that came from even one bishop that was a mm-hmm. close friend of mine said to me, Margie, we do not understand the ways of God. He may mm-hmm. have allowed you to fall in such a big way because he knew that you were going to have zeal and passion mm-hmm. and he mm-hmm. needed you to do mm-hmm. that work for him. And without mm-hmm. that failure, you wouldn't have done it. So, yeah, yeah. And then I love it that you taught priests because I have a, my two ministries that the Lord has given me is Eucharistic adoration and priests. Mm-hmm. And it, to me, they are the most important 
they're so important for us because without them, we do not have the Eucharist. We do not mm-hmm. have mass. And so I guess, did you teach them in a seminary or? Where yes. You- yes. I, uh, until last um, September, I worked at Holy Apostles College and Seminary. Oh. And um, we also for taught. Older. Isn't that for us more? It was. It was. But now they, they take all ages. Oh, really? And uh, many young men from Vietnam. Uh, we trained Eritrean priests who were in Eritrea. Um, so the reason I wrote the book was not only to, it wasn't that my story is that unique, but I wanted to point out if she had succeeded, I'm not saying that I was the only person that could form these people academically. Obviously I'm not, but the thing is that I did. Exactly. And so, so because of that, there are priests who know, my take on theology, you know, I use Thomas Aquinas, and um, somebody else could have done as good a job, but it was me who did it. And I think that God may have allowed what my mother did so that I could give that testimony. Absolutely. That is, that, that is, you're, what you're just saying is very similar to some of the stories in, in this book, you know, mm-hmm. and it's so funny that you bring up Thomas Aquinas because there's a story about Thomas Aquinas in there. <laughs> it's oh. really funny. My husband is a, a broker dealer and mm-hmm. he insisted that I would go to school to learn, to become a series seven, which is a very hard test. And it's sort of like, it's sort of like the CPA exam. Mm-hmm. And only because if he died, then the residuals of his commissions would still be there because I would have a license. Well, I was all involved in volunteer stuff in the church and did not want to do this. But my husband asked me, so I had to obey. I went to school. I was older and there's all these young kids in this class for for a month, you know, and they're looking at me like I'm crazy. And and then I go to take the test and they're all going for series six, which is easier. I'm the only one going for series seven. They're looking at this old lady taking series seven. So I said, Lord, I said to Thomas Aquinas, look, you're the dumb ox and I don't want to do this. This test is really hard. So 600 questions and it's six hours. So the, you bring a calculator with you, right? So I said to Thomas, I will click on this computer for all the answers. And if you can have, you have control of the computer. If I put something wrong in there, you take it out, you know, and you put the correct answer. So the first 10 questions, I knew all the answers. I thought I was so good. I was didn't have to, I didn't need Thomas. After that, I didn't know what they were saying on the questions. So here I am sweating for six hours, do this whole thing, finish. It ends and I think, thank you, God, I'm out of here. And then the computer pulls up a, a thing that says, we're going to, ta- we're going to give you your results in 60 seconds. Stay right here. I didn't want to see what the answer was. But anyway, you had a passing was 70 and I got a 78. So wow. Thomas Aquinas is a broker dealer. <laughs> and that story is in the book. And there's a picture of Thomas in there. And yeah. it was so funny because people knew I would pray it to Thomas Aquinas, the people that were staying at my house. I come home. They didn't know what the what the score was, but there's a big banner that says, Congratulations, Thomas, on being a broker dealer. And then I told them he was. He got 78. <laughs> <laughs> so I love it that you brought up Thomas Aquinas. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that mm-hmm. story was to represent to people that we should always use the saints to intercede for us because they mm-hmm. are extremely powerful. Mm-hmm. And, you know, why not, you know, help me so that I would not be deterred from doing God's work instead of just having to focus on studying for this series seven exam. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. It, anyway, that was a. That was kind of a, a unique story. In the book. Yeah, yeah. That's funny. I believe it, though. They do aid us. There's no question. Oh, they my gosh. Us. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. There's there's another one in there about the souls in purgatory. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, That's I, I interesting that you mentioned that because I'm thinking of writing a book on purgatory. Oh, are you really? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Well, uh, I think the souls in purgatory – they can't do anything for themselves, but they can do things for us. Mm-hmm. And so if we intercede for them, 
they're going to try because they have access, greater access than we have here on earth. And mm-hmm. so there's one soul in purgatory there that um, helped me get something through the mail. And it's really an interesting story. What would you, what, what, in what direction of the souls of purgatory were you going to write your book? I mean, what was it um, going to focus on? Uh, well, I just came up with this idea about two weeks ago um, because I've lost now two husbands. And um, one was extremely religious, the first one who died of esophageal cancer. The second one was Catholic, kind of. <laughs> you know? um, so I worry uh, the first one was Catholic and he never missed Mass. I mean, if he missed Mass... He had to be like really, really sick. And then he'd go to confession like he could have gotten there. It's like, no, if you'd gone there, I think they would have thrown you out by the way you were sneezing and coughing and wheezing. (laughs) But um, but, so he was very religious. And I mean, I can't imagine he was. um, I mean, I can't imagine him. I'm sure he sinned, but not noticeably. Um, So. I think it was rare if he did, but the other one was just a regular guy. He was an exceptionally nice person. He would never deliberately hurt anybody. But when we went to mass, I was practically dragging him by the collar, (laughs) you know? And I mean, he really didn't have any interest. We were married 15 years before he died last November. And um, by the end, I had gotten to the point where I had gotten him to the point where um, he was starting to willingly go. Um, He was, he was a fine person. He was a good person, but he was, he was not a religious Catholic. And then, um, you know, when he died, uh, which I took this as, uh, I don't know how to interpret this, but he died in the hospital. Um, <clears throat> he had um, he had heart, kidney, and liver uh, failure, and he was fine that morning when I walked in the hospital. Um, he he thought they thought he was going home. He was in cardiac intensive care. They were they were going to release him that day or as soon as the wheelchair ramp was finished. So I called the construction guys. I said, you know, as soon as you finish that wheelchair ramp, let me know and he can go home. So I was there too early. It was not yet visiting hours. So we kissed each other, told each other we loved each other. I went out, got breakfast, came back, same thing. I sat down and he was really happy. He was like, oh, I'm going home. And then all of a sudden, and this took less than 10 seconds, maybe five seconds, I heard a little pop inside him and then red flush went up and his eyes froze and he was gone oh my God. so um i went uh out into the hall and screamed for help doctor came in he wanted to know if he wanted extraordinary and i said yes they worked on him i i have to say i am impressed with the medical profession because i had always thought they really didn't care about old people that much and i'm sure there are some that don't Right. But that man worked on my husband for 35 minutes. I don't know why his shoulders didn't come out his back. He worked so hard on my husband. And a doctor came out and she said, you know, even if we bring him back now, there's been no oxygen in his brain for 35 minutes. So, <clears throat> so he wouldn't even know if he was alive. So I went in and I, to me, that was extraordinary at that point. So I went in and said, you know, let him go, which was the hardest thing I have ever done in my entire life. I'll bet. Um, But um, he wouldn't have had any brain left. So um, the long and the short of it is that was the good part of the story. So I had also screamed for a chaplain and I one woman looked up. She would, they were all looking at monitors of hearts of these cardiac patients. And I said, I need a priest and I need one right away. And she said, Roman Catholic. I said, yes. She said, OK, I'll call the chaplain's office. In the chaplain's office, there was a Roman Catholic priest and there was a Protestant woman. And it was the priest's day off. 
So he said to her, you handle it. Oh. So she came up he and I there? saw her. He was there? He was there? He, le- he left and went on oh. his day off. He left the hospital. So I, um, I was in a panic when I saw this woman. And I said, you've got to get a priest. You've got to get a priest. And so um, they were still working on him. So, I mean, technically he was dead, but they were trying to bring him back. And so uh, she uh, found a very old priest who was in the area somewhere living, I guess. And he came in and gave him the last rites, but he was already Mm -hmm. dead. And I got to say, that is the most heartbreaking thing, you know, because the priest was there. It doesn't take that long to do last rites. He just Absolutely. wanted to show it was his day off and he wasn't going to be f- forced mm-hmm. around. And I mean, it broke my heart. So um, he was dead when he received the last rites. I don't know what that means. You know? yeah, they say, I, I've read many mystics and they say the soul is still there for a while, we do not yes. know the amount of time. So, yeah. um, in fact, the story, I can't believe you, you said that the story about my brother dying of a drug overdose, um, and I, he was a fallen away Catholic, you know, obviously being a drug addict. I was more devastated over not his physical death, but his spiritual death. Yeah. And that was what just drove me crazy. I would cry in confession all the time that I wasn't there for him, didn't get the last rites, like you're saying, Mm -hmm. everything like that. And one priest then finally at at a retreat center here in Dallas said to me, you must stop this right now. He said, we, your tears, your prayers. And I had Gregorian mass that said for my brother, and I found out that he was dead three years after he died. So so I had the, 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 the Gregorian Masses said three years later, he said, your tears, your prayers, and the Gregorian Masses, God has no time. He would know that you're going to do that. And he applied the merits of that at your brother's soul at the moment of death and stop. Mm-hmm. You have to obey me and, and stop, you know, doing this. So I never did it again in confession, but one day, I went to confession to a priest in Lubbock, Texas, who had spiritual gifts in confession, sort of like Padre Pio, that he could mm-hmm. read calls. I never said a word. I'm in confession. In the middle of the confession, the priest stops and he says to me, oh, my gosh, I see a young man and he's got black and white stripes and he's totally despondent. That's like as a as a convict. My brother was in jail several times as a convict. He said, oh, no, it, the priest starts yelling. He said, his arms are raised. He's radiant white. And he's looking up in joy. Do you know who this is? And Uh I looked at him. I said, yes, father, that's my brother. And Uh I had not uh, inside. I I believe that first priest, but I had still misgivings that my brother's soul was lost. But then through the mercy of God, Uh this priest was able to tell me that what that priest said was true. It was applied to my brother's soul at the moment Uh of death. And I know that my brother was saved because of this mystical Uh experience. So now when you're, um, you're wanting to write a book about purgatory. Uh So in what, um, and is it about because of the two husbands that you lost and that, that you would intercede to their souls and, You know, I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to do. It just was like I was working on the computer, which is primarily statistics for different Catholic institutions and uh, some teaching. And um, I have an MFA in writing. That's why I I had gotten that so I could write the survivor story. But um, I don't know. I just knew I have to. I know I have to write something about purgatory. Yes. Yes. And um, so um, I think a lot of people don't even believe in it anymore. Absolutely. And uh, maybe, you know, maybe that's the, the road I'll take. I don't know. But I do think that those two men who uh, literally died in front of me, Mm-hmm. Which uh, made me, uh, I mean, when you think of the the irony that I almost wasn't born, I was almost killed before I was born. Right. I married twice 
and watch both of those men die. Right, right. And so it's like, I feel like I'm supposed to do this. I don't know why, because it's not like I go around thinking about purgatory all the time until the last two weeks. <laughs> and then it's like, but this is, this has happened. Um, I was, uh, I'm sorry. I, every time I think about uh, right. Bill, it's too close, you know. Um, but anyway, um, I was on my way down to uh, Albertus Magnus in uh, New Haven, Connecticut, where I was going for an MFA in writing, creative mm-hmm. writing. And I was, I was, I had not yet declared my major. It was like, uh, was I going to do fiction or nonfiction, you know, something like that. And I had been thinking of fiction because I was thinking of pro-life fiction. Right. And all of a sudden, when this was the second time it happened to me in my life, I had a ticker tape run through my head. I know that isn't really what happened, but it felt like it, right. I saw words go through my head. And it said the only the only words were write nonfiction. It's like, <laughs> okay. And I, I literally went, okay. <laughs> no. But the first no, time that is. happened, I actually was when I converted. I was in Rome with my first husband and the family <laughs> and ended up on a tour. I wasn't anti-Catholic. I was just not religious. And I ended up going into the catacombs because we were on a bus tour and there was no heat. Uh, there was no uh, air conditioning. I went in and I'm walking by these people who are having mass. And I was so ignorant. I said to myself, why are they having mass? It's not Sunday. You know? <laughs> no. So anyway, I went and I, I eventually found the tour group and uh, joined up. And there was a man, an Asian man in a black cassock. I assume he was a priest, but I'm, I don't know that. And I mentioned he was Asian because I taught so many Vietnamese men in the seminary. Right. right. But anyway, so he was Asian. I'm standing there listening to him, not getting anything out of it because I don't know anything about it. And then all of a sudden that ticker tape went through. That was the first time. And it said the truth is where the Catholic, is in the Catholic Church. And the T was capitalized. And my initial thought was, whoever wrote that has bad grammar. Yes. <laughs> right. You know, so it's like that was, that was really weird. The telling and, God and, and the, bad the capitalization grammar. was wrong. <laughs> right. And then, it. you know, it's like um, I knew what actually made me convert is I knew that that didn't come from me. There was no way I ever could have imagined See? that. That's right. You know, that came from outside of me. So so those two messages, you know. Have you ever heard of the book uh, by the mystic Maria Sima, Get Me Out of Here? <laughs> no. Those, it's a book. She was a mystic in Belgium. Mm-hmm. And she had mystical experience with the souls in purgatory. You need to uh, read that book. I and will. She, it, I mean, it's fascinating. And um, there's a story. What is this story in my book? how that book affected me it it was i won't go into it i want you to read the story but anyway she had the souls would come to her and be at the foot of her bed and tell Mm -hmm. her what they needed to be released from purgatory and you know so she would pray for them but then she would ask them for things to make happen for her and they would do it so that she would be able to do the masses or the rosaries or whatever it is they mm-hmm. needed. And mm-hmm. so it's very fascinating. There's the, lots of short stories like that. That I, I don't think Maria Sim is alive any longer, but it's a very well done book. Get me out of here. That's, mm-hmm. that's, mm-hmm. They're, they're telling her, get me yeah. out of here. So yeah. Really well, you know, I do, I do believe in those experiences because, um, you know, you hear, you don't hear about them often. But when you hear about them, they have a there's a ring of truth to them. Absolutely. That, that nobody could have made this up. Exactly. You know? And, um, you know, so that's why when I was like just sitting here doing statistics and, and working for one of the, the uh, I work for Pontifex University, mm-hmm. which is a, a very nice institution. They're, they're really, they're on the cutting edge, I think. And uh, I was just sitting there sitting right here working and all of a sudden bang it's like i think i'm going to write about purgatory (laughs) that that just doesn't happen 
it, you know, it's like it just doesn't pop into your head. For, I mean, it's like, gee, maybe I should maybe I should write about Lulu the cat. You know, it's like it's weird. It comes out of nowhere. And it's like, uh, here we go again. <laughs> well, and I, I learned the lesson. If if you don't obey that inspiration, yeah. you'll, you'll regret it. Because yeah. I, I once had an inspiration and I didn't follow through. And then the, the Lord will show us what good could have come from following the inspiration he put. He put that in your head. It didn't come from yeah. nowhere. Yeah, and so I know. That, that's the part that always worries me. I tell uh, all my friends, we're, we Catholics are so fortunate. We have confession. We can go to confession and for for all the, the sins we commit, it's the sins of omission that I yeah. worry about. When we go face him and he says, remember when I put that on your mind to do that? And then you didn't do it. And then he shows you down to eternity. How many souls could have been affected in a good way if you obeyed the inspiration he gave them? So yeah. I, I really believe that came from him. And it's something yeah. that you're going to yeah. have to go forward with. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I intend to. Um, but I am. I need to figure out what exactly I'm supposed to do, other than write right. about purgatory. Right. <laughs> you know? But yeah. But the you know that's um, it's it's amazing to me how you know here you have the creator of the universe. I mean, you'd think that he'd have enough to do making sure the galaxies don't run into each <laughs> other or something, you know. And meanwhile, in Springfield, Vermont, he just <laughs> says, "Well, we'll give her this thought." <laughs> You know, and it's like I'm thinking, did any galaxies crash while he was doing that? You know what? I, I always say that too. I said it in the book. I see him sometimes just giggling at us yeah. because we think we know it all and we've got it under control. And then all of a sudden, you know, it works the way he wanted it. And then he just sits there and I could see him covering his mouth and giggling, watching our foolish mm-hmm. little antics, thinking mm-hmm. that we know better than he does. So mm-hmm. it's really funny. It's yeah. really funny. Yeah, well, you know, I did um, when I first, I don't know if I want to call it inspiration, but when I first got that uh, message slash idea, <laughs> just for the heck of it, I looked at Google. I did a Google on Purgatory. And the first one that came up was this saint. No, I can't pronounce her last name, but it's uh, Sister Maria. She she was well known for seeing the souls in purgatory. And um, can't think of her last name now either. But she had seen, she, she talked about multitudes of people that she had seen who were in purgatory who went to heaven. And um, that there were some who didn't go to heaven because no one interceded. Right. And I thought, wow, you know, so she said that of all the people, uh, you know, because we don't know, you know, if you die in a state of grace, you you always think, well, I'm going to go to heaven. But in fact, you may still have all kinds of stuff to work off. To work off. That's exactly right. And so that's not necessarily true. So people go to purgatory. And she said that she'd seen multitudes but that only three people that she saw who had died went directly to heaven and did not go to purgatory. And I thought, you know, all right. So first I get this, I ought to write about purgatory. And then I get this and it's like, wow, the first Google, you know, and. Well, uh, well, that's that's why I hate in today's world when we go to a funeral they mm-hmm. always say, oh, the soul is now in heaven. That is really wrong to do that because then it doesn't allow the people that know that soul to pray for them. Yeah. Like you just yeah. said, there were souls that didn't go because nobody was praying for them. Yeah. Yeah. Because they, we just automatically think everybody's going straight to heaven. And even I think the Blessed Mother has said in some apparitions, I don't know if it was Fatima or Lourdes or whatever, that she said most souls go to purgatory. Yes. And the second most souls go to hell and the mm-hmm. fewest go straight to heaven. Yeah. The yeah. few, the very yeah. fewest go straight to heaven. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. we should be, so that's probably the direction that you need to go. It's that people understand the importance of praying for the souls in purgatory. You know, mm-hmm. it's just, mm-hmm. there's, there's one missing. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know if it's Bridget of Sweden or whatever. There's one prayer that the Lord gave her that a, we pray that every day at Rosary Group that a thousand souls are released every time that prayer is said. It's in that little 
Pieta prayer book. I don't know if you've ever seen that one. And there's mm-hmm. one prayer in there that a thousand souls get released. And we pray that one every day. So, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing because death is such a mystery. I mean, life is a mystery too, but death is such a mystery and what happens after it. So, you know, I mean, when prior to seeing my first husband die, I mean, it was like, you know, I, I didn't really, I'd seen people in coffins, of course, but I had not been present for anything like this. Right. And when he died, I felt him leave the room. And I knew, I knew, I don't know how I knew, as inspiration or a blessing from God. When he, he died, he was standing up. I was holding him up and he bled out. And um, I know that he didn't end. I know that he walked out of the room with Christ. Right. And it was like, whoa. Whoa, yeah. Whoa. You know, and um, because he was very religious, as I said. Um, and, uh, you know, it was like, there was no doubt. I mean, Christ walked in that room and took him out. He didn't end. He went somewhere else. And I mean, to me, that was such a blessing to know that. And also, I mean, by just knowing that now, I know that that can happen to others and you do go somewhere else. Question is where. But it's a very good point that you brought up, too, because some people don't even think there's an afterlife. I know. I know. And you knew that he was there. He was still there. You yep. know, yep. not he in left, physical, but he, he was still left there. the room. He left the room left with the room. Christ. No question but, about it. But there are many people today that think this is it. Yeah. When you die, that's it. I mean, yeah. that is crazy. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. how do you, I, I don't know how I could live in today's world not mm-hmm. having faith. You know, yeah. it's just, yeah. it's the hard, tough yeah. world mm-hmm. today. Yeah. But the, the problem that I have, um, of course, I mean, Jimmy was extremely devout, um, mm-hmm. very, very extreme Catholic. Um, Bill was not. And when Bill died, I knew he was gone, but I didn't feel anything else. Uh-huh. So that worries me. Well, um have you did have you had Gregorian masses said for Bill? You know, I don't even know where you get a Gregorian mass done. Okay, okay. Um, <laughs> I, I got it. I I've got to send you the information. But okay. there, you got to read the, the, the story in the book because mm-hmm. you have no idea now how many people are doing Gregorian masses. It's a promise from Pope Saint Gregory, and it happened. I had to explain it to a bishop too, so don't feel bad that you know. <laughs> the bishop okay. said after he read the book, he said, "Please explain to me about this because they're not. They were. It wasn't taught in seminary about the different devotions and different. So I, I believe God is so merciful; He gives us every kind of key or skill or whatever He could do to get us with Him. Everything. Mm-hmm. So this, and I'll, I'll give you a short version of the story. This monk. Um, I think it was a Carthusian or Benedictine, like whatever. And this was in 1890-something. Um, they have poverty, chastity, and obedience, but he had kept a little gold coin. So he didn't, because he, he wasn't um, practicing the vow of poverty correctly mm-hmm. and something like that. And then he died and the monks found that he didn't, that he, this coin or something like that. And they were distraught because they knew that he broke his vows. So they decided to pray for him for 30 days straight without intermission, without any other intermission. And they prayed for him 30 days straight. Well, the monk came back and appeared to them and told them, because you did that 30 days in succession, my soul was released and am now in heaven. So the I think it was Pope St. Gregory who then heard about it and he made that indult. And that's why they call it Gregorian Masses. And so that was a promise from the Lord. And, and that's the way the Pope put it out. That promise of the Lord that and it's not like a superstitious thing. It's it's a mm-hmm. a grace filled thing. So mm-hmm. if you can get 30 days that cannot be broken. Mm-hmm. And you get the 30 days done in succession. The promise is that the soul is released. So I have done it for my parents 
for my brother and um, for all different people. And there's another story in the book where I told somebody to do it. And then God gave her a very prominent sign that yes, the daughter, the daughter had committed suicide and he gave her a sign that the daughter was released. Mm -hmm. And so that's how powerful the Mm -hmm. the Gregorian masses are. So for Bill, right? That was, it was Bill. It's your second. Bill Wilson. Bill, I, I would suggest that you have that done for him. And then, and then I, to my cousin whose daughter committed suicide, I told her the Lord will not always give us the sign. We just have to have trust and faith, yeah. but sometimes he will. And I mm-hmm. said, so after the 30 days are over, keep looking for the sign. And after the 30 days were over, she looked for the sign and it was explicitly, explicitly given to her in a quote in, uh, in mass about it, 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 it. I told her, she called me then and told me what she had read. And I said, the Lord couldn't have written it on a blackboard any clearer to you. Yeah than what he just did to you at church, reading that quote this morning, that your daughter was released. So mm-hmm. I know, so it, you feel total peace with the first husband, but the second husband, you want to be sure that yeah. you can help him. And so, yeah. and there is no time with God. So he died last November, you said, I think you said yeah. last November. Yeah, uh, November brother, 28th. Right. My brother was t- three years later that I had the Gregorian as it said. So God will know what's in your heart and we'll take care of bill. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Email me that information. We, uh, yeah, I'll send you the information. There's different, um, you you can't get it done in a parish because they, you know how they have to, to say masses for people that passed away and everything has to be usually a monastery, you know, where they could say it 30 days in succession. So they, they, they don't break it. And so sometimes it's places that are uh, foreign uh, missions and stuff like that. They'll do it. Mm-hmm. But in fact, I think there's one in Chicago that's a uh, foreign mission that does it. But I have an, another contact. that's a, an old retired archbishop and he does it. So. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. Well. So. Well. <laughs> This has been quite an interview. <laughs> I have to give you credit. I've never cried during an interview before. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, I, I I have the gift. of That is a gift, you know, to have the yeah. gift of tears. And yeah. um, I just, I had to do an interview for EWTN uh, on the book too. Mm-hmm. And um, they just sent me the, the interview. They took the commercials out and everything so that um, Sebastian could put it on the website and I was listening to it and I cried because mm-hmm. it was cried with God's love and mercy. So yeah. if you go to the website and you listen mm-hmm. to it, you might cry again. <laughs> yeah, I um, I was once given the gift of tears. It was it was different because I had just become Catholic. And uh, my first husband, as I said, was extremely Catholic. So we went to um, Montreal and uh-huh. we went to the oratory. Oh, yeah. And so uh, I walked in the oratory, which was like humongous. And I'm looking around. And it's like, oh, this place is huge. I stepped over. I stepped in. So the door closed behind me. And I started to cry. And mm-hmm. I cried for six hours. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. And, and I couldn't stop. And it was like, my husband's like, what's wrong with you? It's like, I have no idea. And I just <laughs> kept crying. Six hours it was. And it didn't stop when I walked out and the door shut behind me. It stopped. It stopped. Yeah. It stopped. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that was amazing because, you know, I'd never even heard of the gift of tears. I just thought there was something really weird going on here (laughs) with me, you know. And it wasn't until later I heard about it and I thought, oh, that's what that was. So it was very cleansing, I guess I would say. Yes, yes. It is. And so sometimes people are embarrassed to cry, but mm-hmm. we really, we really shouldn't be embarrassed. It's there. It is a gift. It's a cleansing kind of gift. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. at least 
Uh, but I, I cry very easily. So mm-hmm. I always get uh, nervous when I have to do one of these talks too, because if I talk, like when I talk about my brother, I get filled up and then I think, oh God, yeah. I'm going to cry, you know? Yeah. And then, I mean, I have to uh, give talks at different groups and stuff like that. And then mm-hmm. I have to turn away and wipe my eyes because I'm right in the middle of the talk, you know, and it's, mm-hmm. you think it's embarrassing, but then you never know. It might affect in a, in a positive way, somebody that was mm-hmm. there in the audience too. So yeah. Yeah. Well, to me, it was when I when I cried like that, it was like, again, it was the second time I'd had a religious experience or a spiritual experience. So it was like, uh, okay, you know, um, I was in actually I was in the process of converting at that time. I wasn't I wasn't Catholic yet, Uh but I was in the process. I converted with a wonderful priest. He's uh, now a hermit in West Virginia, I believe, or Virginia. And um, he had gotten this pilgrimage together, you know, and uh, boy, I'll tell you. It, where did, it was really where was amazing. the pilgrimage? Where was the pilgrimage? It was into Montreal. Into the, oh, the one, the, the one in Montreal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, um, you know, that was, you know, so the priest was looking at me. He knew what was going on, but I sure didn't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and my husband was like, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? I don't know. <laughs> but the minute I walked out the door, it stopped. It stopped. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. stopped. It started and it stopped in a yeah. second. It was uh, interesting. It is. You know, because I'd never experienced anything like that. I know. So. Anyway. Anyway. Mm-hmm. Well, I thank you for this interview. It's been uh, <laughs> it's been a very good one for me. <laughs> very, it was very delightful. I yeah, really yeah. I look forward to it. We'll 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 listen to it when we're not talking anymore <laughs> on the side. Go yeah. go to the side and listen to it. So it was wonderful. It was wonderful to meet you. Yeah, and, same here. Uh, so I'm glad we met. So hopefully we'll meet in person one of these days. Yep, I hope so. <laughs> mm-hmm. yep. and uh, just send me that info when you get a chance okay and I'm, I'm going to tell Sebastian to get one of my books to you <laughs> okay thank you thank you so much <laughs> okay Okay. God bless you yeah, thank you Cynthia yeah. okay uh, would you like to close us in prayer sure um, mm-hmm. uh, dear Father Holy Son and Holy Spirit thank you for this opportunity to share about your love and mercy. I humbly ask that at least one soul was touched with our discussion and will come to follow you. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Take care. Okay, you too. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.